Hey everybody, welcome to Real Life, and we are gonna be having an amazing time right now. We hope you enjoy it. Charlie Kirk and I are gonna be talking about Genesis 11 and how it applies to our world today. What's going on in the world and what's happening in relation to Genesis 11? You might be shocked. So listen, be blessed by this. Jesus said that in the last days before he returns, that it would be as it were in the days of Noah and as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, but we don't often think about as it was in the days of Nimrod. And uh, if you're a student of eschatology, which is Bible prophecy, the prophetic word of God, which is 27 to 30% of the Bible, Nimrod is understood in Bible prophecy as a, a forerunner, a prototype of what we would call today uh, the Antichrist. First John tells us that there's many Antichrists, that they are against Christ, but he said there's also the Antichrist that's coming. Well, Nimrod is a forerunner of that. We're gonna talk about that tonight, and we're gonna uh, bring together uh, what happened then and what is happening now, and uh, there's nobody better uh, to talk about this stuff than Charlie, seeing how you are the official a uh, reset guy and everything yeah, else. You know, Jack, thank you for that. I, I, and all of you, but mostly Jack. You know, I get stopped in the grocery store. I get stopped at airports. You're the great reset guy. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I'm the one that's doing the great reset? No, I mean, th so thank you, Jack. I get all sorts of wonderful You're letters in welcome. the mail and death threats and all thanks to you. And I'm eternally grateful uh, to be known as the Great Reset Guy. But tonight, we're going to build off of that yep. and add a new wrinkle. But also, if you've not heard any of those discussions before, that's okay, because this is also a really important place to start. And so Jack and I were texting back and forth. I said, Jack, I've been really diving into Genesis 11, and I think there's so much to be learned from this for the time that we're in, where we are headed, and also this idea, does the Bible clearly speak to political matters. Yeah. It's all right there in Genesis 11. It's all right there. So it's amazing what we're gonna be talking about tonight, and I'm so happy uh, to know that Charlie was saying earlier today that Genesis 1 through 11 have, have become the most important parts of the Bible to him, and my heart jumped inside of me. I don't know uh, if many of you know that, but everything about the entire Bible, all 66 books, is really, really condensed in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. From redemption, salvation, globalism, uh, of obviously creation, uh, and so much more. It's just absolutely incredible. So he's been studying that. We're going to be looking into it. And um, it's a great time right now because of all the talk about globalism, all the talk about uh, nations basically breaking down. Think about it. It's almost as though things are so skewed that who's in charge here? And filling the gap and the void are some institutions that are even non-elected type institutions like the World Economic Forum. I mean, these are non-elected people. Yeah, and this text is so amazing because it shows what man tries to do every time they try to get power. And this pattern will replicate itself whether it's in yeah. the Fertile Crescent, whether it's in Mesopotamia, whether it's in the Nile River. It, man will always act the same. And that's why Genesis 1 through 11 is so important and why every pastor in America should slow down That's right. and teach the truth there. It tells you why you're here. It tells you what type of being you are. It tells you that you need Jesus Christ. It says it so clearly yes. that you need redemption, that God is gonna send a rescue mission because he loves you so much. It says explicitly that yes. God loves you in the first 11 books of Genesis. So it all lays it out. But it also lays out this idea of what happens when human beings mm -hmm defy God, and they try to do things for themselves, especially when it comes to political matters. And so I hear from pastors all the time, you know, the Bible doesn't speak clearly about politics, it's just, I only preach the gospel. I hear this, it's nauseating, I'm sure you hear it too. Yeah. This right here yeah. is an explicitly political text. So what is politics? Let's just put all of everything you think you know about politics, let's put aside. It's very simple. Politics is human beings organizing to decide who gets power. That's it. Stop talking about Republicans or Democrats. All that stuff is just temporary manifestations of an eternal question of who gets power. 
Now in Genesis 11, they say it explicitly. That's right. They say, and this is important first, because it's called the Tower of Babel, but it really is more accurately the city of Babel. Yeah. And I want to zero in on that. The tower is important because they wanted to reach the heavens, and that kind of gets the headline. But the very lead is that they wanted to build a centralized community, a city for themselves. And they made a decision to deny and defy God. That's right. We're going to do this for ourselves. We're going to do something so great in the earthly and temp temporal realm that we don't need God. And that right there is a direct challenge to what was set up in the first 10 books before that, that there is a God and you are not him. That's right. And in Genesis 11, Nimrod and his people said, no, 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 no. We're going to make a name for ourselves. That's right. We're going to do, we don't need God. Look at how amazing, and this is why the text is so incredible. It tells you the type of bricks that they're using. That's right. This shows you that this really happened, by the way. This is not some sort of fable. Thank it's you. It's not some sort of fairy it's not a tale. Story. This is real. This happened. This is history. It's trying to teach us that we're always, because of our broken nature, as it says in Genesis 6, the heart of man, That's right. that if we are not self aware and constantly making sure we're oriented to God, then we are going to do things for ourselves and it's going to end terribly. That's one of the things that Genesis 11 is trying to teach us. Isn't it interesting that Nimrod said, let's build a city. First time we ever hear that. And cities are known for the propagation of evil That's right. and danger. Man doesn't do well in cities unless God is the builder. It's interesting. Both the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and Thomas Jefferson both hated big cities. The American founders read this text and they designed a system of government to say, we do not want all this power in cosmopolitan, densely populated urban areas. That's right. In fact, the founding fathers were so biblically literate. If you read the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton, Federalist 47, Federalist 51, Federalist 58, mm. they talk time and time again about the heated passions in cities where rancor, rumor, and half-truths reign supreme, where the mobs and the masses are able to get what they want, but reason goes to die. Wow. God tried to warn us in Genesis 11, hey, if you guys build these cities, all of a sudden you're not gonna be governed by your reason, your rationality, or your logic, but it's going to be the tyranny of the clamoring majority. My goodness, yeah, you look at great. federalism, states' rights, you look at this idea of the local church, all of that is saying, we learn the lesson from Genesis 11 and we're not going to try to build something central or something big or something strong. And you see that at direct odds with the World Economic Forum with what they're doing right now. Yeah. The World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, what are they doing? They might as well sing this as their national anthem or their international anthem, right? Wow, yeah. We are going to make a city for ourselves. We're gonna do this thing. We're gonna change human nature. We're going to be like That's gods. Right. Now, the first 11 books of Genesis, and Genesis 11 combines all the, almost every one of these forces together, is it sets up the necessary distinctions of which we take for granted. One of the tricks of the enemy, and the end times talk about this, and Jack, you know, you talk about this so brilliantly and wonderfully, is going to be the intentional blurring mm -hmm. of distinctions that allow us to be free, that allow us to grow closer to God. And every single one of them is laid out in the first 11 books of Genesis. For example, the distinction of God and man, that we are not God and we should worship God, but we are made in the image of God, as it says in Genesis 1, and 1, As it says in Genesis 1, 1, which is the verse that changes everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means that there is a being greater than you that has a purpose for you to be here, that your existence is not a mistake. The World Economic Forum does not believe that. The World Economic Forum that recently met, like you said in Davos, they produced, they published a bunch of papers, but one of the papers uh, that they put out was a discussion that they had regarding uh, the role that faith plays yep. in the World Economic Forum. Now you say, Jack, what, what are you guys talking about World Economic Forum? It's, it's a, a gathering of some of the world's most powerful uh, financiers, bankers, politicians, uh, movers and shakers, we'll sum it up that way. These people go there and they get these ideas from globalists. Then they come back to their countries and they all, so to speak, attempt to say, speak the same language. 
environmentalism, socialism, whatever ism. Let's all talk these talks. We go there to Davos, we unify our speech, we try to assemble what was dissembled at Babel, we're trying to put it together, and then we're gonna launch it in the world and talk one language. What's very interesting is, and I just read it today, on faith, they recognize that faith is a vital role to uh, the human machine, to to humanity. And they seek to work with faith-based people, individuals, because it's such a vital role. They said that they want to meet with faith leaders of the world. They said that they want to have a dialogue with them. And then they published, I think it was seven concerns that the World Economic Forum has regarding religious people. And they listed them. And one of them, I'll bring up a few of them. They're in my memory right now. One of them is that one of the problems with religious people that they need to get over is that they are not willing to experience change. (laughs) Well, I, I disagree. Jesus changed us dramatically and radically. They said that Religious people are, are hard, determined, and set on the belief that abortion is wrong and that globalism is wrong. That needs to change. So watch what they're doing. They're embracing. This is kind of scary, and then I'll let Charlie go. They're, they're talking about faith and the need for it, but they want to control the dialogue and the issues of what faith is defined as. And so when you read it, you come away with this. Watch out for pastors who are globalist-minded. You say, I would never listen to a globalist-minded pastor. There are pastors who are embracing, for example, socialism. There are pastors who are, who are embracing racism. Uh, LBGTQ, add whatever. How did this happen? It's part of a global agenda And it's happening worldwide at the same time. Absolutely remarkable. They said it. They're not hiding it. The question is, wherever you fellowship, is it happening in your religious denomination or faith-based group? You need to be careful. These days are here. What's very interesting is the fake and false religions of the isms. Marxism, LGBTQism, wokeism. What we know obviously through our, you know, our common sense and our life and shared existence, but also what we know in Genesis 11 is that there is this gap between God and man. We believe only Jesus Christ can bridge that gap because Jesus is God. That's, That's right. why. That's it is right. God becoming man. That's right. The human beings do wacky and weird stuff to try to bridge that gap. And in reality, they actually usually create more distance when they start to embrace these isms. Now, when you read the first 11 books of Genesis, I encourage you to do this understanding some backdrop that as this book was written, as Moses was given to this directly by God, the predominant view of the region and in the known world was paganism, Mm -hmm. was multiple gods. There's a river god, there's a rock god, there's a sun god, there's all these different gods. And the contention of the Bible is that there is one god, that is, that is such an, that was an unknown concept. What do you mean there's one God? Not only is there one God, whatever he says happens. And God spoke it into existence. Yes. And God spoke it into existence. And he created distinction. And he created good from evil and man from woman. And God is not in nature. This idea that God is not in nature was a, was a history changing idea that we That's take right. for granted. That's right. And guess what? That idea is now predominant here in America. It's called environmentalism. That's right. The Bible clearly states that you as a human being have dominion over the earth. It's a hierarchy, right? God over man, man over nature. There's a hierarchy to the existence. Radical environmentalism does not make that contention. They say man and nature are on equal footing if actually man might be subservient to nature, right? right? That's right. right. Where they'll go so as far to say that you should never disenfranchise the Delta smelt. What are you? You're just... You're a rather inefficient creature. You have to go to the restroom all the time. You fight. You go to prison. You, you know, murder each other. Look at the beautiful Delta smelt. By the way, this is one of the most ridiculous things we teach our kids, that nature is nothing but serene. Nature is bitter and harsh and awful. The point I'm trying to make here, though, is that the Bible clearly lays out that these distinctions, this hierarchy, is necessary for any sort of civilization to exist. It is no coincidence 
that as all of a sudden God scatters man throughout the earth, the very next chapter, he tells Abram to get off his tail and go leave your father's home to go on an adventure. That's right. There's no, that, that is not a coincidence. That is by deliberate design. Out of paganism. Out of paganism. And so we right now, the World Economic Forum, what is pervading our time is we are living, whether you realize it or not, in widespread paganism. In polytheism has reemerged. Atheism is not as powerful as polytheism, where everybody has their own viewpoint, right. their own God, and their own view system. I say, well, Charlie, what's so wrong with that? Obviously, minus the scriptures where it says man will do whatever is right in his own eyes. It's very simple. If you have many gods, you have many moralities. That's right. If you have one God, you have one morality. This is why, as a country, we can't say it's wrong to chop off an eight-year-old's private parts. Right. Because if there's many gods, there's many moralities. My God, my belief says that that's perfectly fine. As we become less monotheistic and more polytheistic, right. AKA shred the truths of the Bible as a society, you go what? You get into the moral chaos that Babel received. Which all these things that Charlie and I are talking about are real tangible forerunners of a coming one world economy, a coming one world government, and look what we're seeing about a coming one world police. This, stuff's, this stuff is actually going on. And um, it all plays into it. You see, Jack, that's just crazy. It may sound crazy, but the Bible anticipated it. And um, I'm concerned right now personally because I see, um, I see America almost like a, uh, it looks like a bomb. And it's, you know, TNT is written on it when the, in the fuse is burning. And that fuse has got maybe 20 months on it left, <laughs> because if you're China or Russia, mainly China, whatever you're gonna do in the world, more than balloons, <laughs> whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna wanna do before uh, Joe Biden leaves office. Because uh, weakness breeds violence. I don't know if you are aware of that, but look what's happening in the world around us right now. The the the. The ridiculous thing in Ukraine is sucking this nation dry of money. It's an ongoing disaster, but we're leaderless. What's happening? A destabilized world will be the cry of a population to bring in a strong leader. And uh, that, that man could very well be alive today somewhere in the world. And, and this is an important point, that destabilization is not an accident, it's the strategy demoralization is not an accident it is the strategy as they try to create the modern day equivalent of the city of babel yep they need to get america out of the way america is a strong independent nation yeah. full of tens of millions of people and in this room you see it that are not going to go willingly along with the recreation of a city of babel so they have to do something to get us out of the way so they're trying to break your resolve and they know they can't go after every single one of you, so they try to pick off the people yeah. that are doing the work that advances liberty and exposes darkness. Right. America is the last nation that stands in the way That's right. to a true global project. Now you might say, well, Charlie, what about China and Russia and all that? They want their own version of the Tower of Babel. But you know what? China and the American left are wonderful partners right now. They yes. finance the woke left. They are cheering on critical race theory. That's right. Because they both have something in common. They both bitterly hate America. And they need to see America taken off the playing field. And so that's where the American people come in. It's the last best hope, besides obviously Jesus Christ and the truth, is your resolve and your commitment. And so there's so many of these different dynamics playing out right now. And I get asked all the time, you know, Charlie, how do you see this ending and how do you see this playing out? I'm, I want you to instead ask yourself the question tonight, what am I going to do? That's right. That's the much more important question because Jack will tell you how it ultimately ends. Spoiler alert, God wins, okay? Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> but we are going to be held to account to what did you do? Were you a spectator or a participant? Yeah. And so the global game has come in right through America. We do not have a border right now in America. That's right. 8,000 people a day walk into our country. 
The idea of a nation is a biblical idea. The idea of a nation with borders and boundaries, which by the way, implies humility. It implies that we're not in charge of the whole world, that we're gonna govern ourselves. Everything that we learn in Genesis 11 about man trying to dominate, man trying to centralize, man trying to create a name for themselves, they think they can get to it very soon. But the question that is yet to be answered is, how will America play along? Well, friends, as you can tell, we are talking, Charlie Kirk and I, about some very, very deep issues. And imagine that. From the book of Genesis, chapter 11, to the modern day news events that are shaping up at this very hour. I want all of you to take a deep breath and think about that for a moment. You might think that the Bible is some ancient old dusty book, but here we are in part one of our time together. We're talking about issues that are in the word of God thousands of years ago that are happening right now. And so with all that's taking place and a modern reassembling of the Tower of Babel, the modern version, it's no stretch to understand that what Nimrod wanted to achieve was a one world governing empire where he himself would be the chief politician, the king, the leader of it all. God's word addresses this. It's in the heart of man. And are we seeing it again? So I hope you learned a lot from what we just gave you, but there's more. Part two is gonna lead us into the conclusion of this very intriguing, very, very powerful message out of Genesis 11 that speaks to our day today. We're living in amazing days. Friends, listen, you don't need to be afraid. I know the tendency is to be fearful. You don't need to be fearful. God's word has been given to us that we can have assurance and that we might know what's coming. God loves us. In the midst of all that's taking place, you need to remember that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again from the dead, and he gave us the Bible that we might be prepared for these last days. So friends, if you want more information, if you wanna connect with us, if you wanna follow us, we would love to have you visit us at jackhibbs.com for a whole lot of more teaching and information. We hope to see you right there. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. There is a deliberate and dangerous movement underway to bring economic, military, and political power under the same umbrella of a one world government. Under the guise of world harmony, influential leaders from all over the globe are seeking to form a new balance of power in the world. Many call it the Great Reset. How does such a movement align with what the Bible says about the last days? What are believers supposed to do about it? Charlie Kirk answers these questions and more in his booklet called The Christian Response to the Great Reset. The clock is ticking on the bomb that seeks to destroy our current freedoms in the name of globalism. Learn how to act decisively and courageously to oppose this life-threatening ideology before it's too late. The Christian Response to the Great Reset is our thank you gift for your generous donation to Real Life Ministries today. Get your copy at jackhibbs.com or by calling 877-777-2346. Order now. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effects. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it in one of the great reasons. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you. Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history, which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. 
Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? We ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.